All right. Ephesians chapter 4. What a great chapter. There's so much that we can go over here this morning, but I'm not going to keep you too long here. We've got a few places we're going to look at today. But um, I'm just going to read for you from Psalm 133, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. God wants churches to be unified. God wants there to be unity within the local church. Uh, the, and what we see here, in, especially in Ephesians chapter 4 and in other places in Scripture, the, the church is referenced as a body. That there are different members of this body, and in order for the body to be functioning properly, the church needs to be in unity. We need to be in one accord, in one place, and, and all having the same mind, and, and you know, it's, which should be esteeming others better than ourselves and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and making sure our doctrine is pure, you know, and, and, and just living our lives for Christ. That should be our main goal, and that is what God wants there to be within the church. Now we're going to jump into to Ephesians chapter 4 as we read this. Keep in mind, you know, what the Bible is teaching us here that with all humility and with all long-suffering, long we want to try to keep this unity of faith within the church because it's so important. Now, we don't take this to the extreme that ecumenicalism takes it to, of just saying, well, anyone that just calls themselves Christian, we all have to be in unity, and there should be no divisions ever over doctrine or things like that. That's ridiculous. Amen. There needs to be division. We need to be separate, but we, that, that's why there's different churches. We are a body here. We don't believe in the Holy Catholic Church, which Catholic means universal. We don't believe in this universal concept that everybody's part of a church. Why? Because the word churches means a congregation. We're all congregated here. <coughs> the whole, all the people who are saved in the world are not gathered together in one place. Right. Not right now. Yeah, we believe in the local church. And we believe our local church ought to have unity. We ought to be together in one place, in one accord, doing what's right. And we ought to value that. And in the, the spirit of having unity, treat people with long suffering and try to work with people to, to just try to get everyone on the same page. So let's start going through Ephesians chapter 4 and look at the way the Bible explains how we ought to do this. Verse number 1, the Bible reads, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is the goal. He's saying, you know, we need lowliness, meekness. <coughs> Why? Because when you're proud and lifted up, that's going to be causing problems in itself. You're not, you're not going to be able to stay at unity or at least stay at peace with people when you got one guy who's just full of himself and thinks he knows everything and wants to tell everyone else how everything is. That doesn't work out very well. We need to have lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, and be able to forbear one another. You know, everyone's going to be at different levels of growth in their, in their spiritual life, and their walk with God. We, we should be having new believers, experienced believers, all different kinds of believers. So as a result, there's going to be people who might just not know certain things in the Bible. Guess what? There's some things in the Bible I don't know. Amen. Okay? There's some things that you don't know. So... We're going to try to make sure that we're all together in the doctrines. Now, the, the basic doctrines, yeah, that's what's going to separate us from a lot of other churches in general anyways. We're King James only. We believe in salvation by grace through faith alone. We don't just give it lip service. We actually believe that works are not required at all. That you don't have to turn from any sins. You don't have to live this righteous life. You don't have to do any of these things to be saved. You just have to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he saved your soul. There's a lot of things that we believe in. We believe in believer's baptism. We don't baptize babies. There's, there's so many things. But as a church, maybe someone's not going to understand those things. Or maybe they haven't heard. Maybe they've been taught the wrong way for a long time. Well, in order to, to keep the unity and, and having a unity within our body here, the proper way of dealing with that is with lowliness, with meekness, with long-suffering, you know, speaking to people, trying to help them along, to see the truth and, and to kind of come together in unity of spirit here. And this is what the Bible is teaching, that we, that we want to have this. 
in the bond of peace. Verse number four, the Bible says there is one body and one spirit, even as you're all called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So these are different positions or roles that he's given men as gifts to be able to, to help the body of Christ, it says here, why did he give apostles? Why did he give prophets? Why did he give evangelists? Why did he give pastors and teachers? Verse 12 says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, when we come into the, you know, as a perfect man, we're complete, we're whole. When you are finally, you know, perfect, you'll understand all doctrine, you'll understand all things, we'll have it right. When we're, when we're out of this sinful flesh, when we're with the Lord, when we could receive our teachings directly from Jesus Christ and, and, you know, we don't have a sinful flesh or anything to worry about, we'll be perfect. Now, we're not there yet, but this is why along the way, God's given us the pastors and teachers and people to help us to come together and to be unified. And for everybody, the saints are those that are sanctified, those that are born again. If your faith is in Jesus Christ, you're born again, you've been sanctified through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that means you're a saint. And I'm not going to go a whole dissertation on, on saints and sanctification, but that's literally what that word means. Saint means you're sanctified. If you're sanctified through the blood of Christ, then you're a saint. So it's for the perfecting of believers. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, right? Building each other up. That's why God also gave these different people to help the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Ephesians chapter 4 is another passage I turn to normally when I try to explain to people the importance of going to church. That you do need to be getting into church because th this, in, in the society, the day that we live in today, there's this um, philosophy that's been put into people's heads that, well, Hey, where two or three are gathered together, the Bible says, there am I in the midst. Well, Jesus is right here with us right now because we're talking about God. So what do I need church for? I could just have church in my house and I could have church here. Have... That's not church. It doesn't make the Bible untrue where Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. But he didn't say that that's church. Who is the elder or the bishop ordained for that church when there's two or three people gathered together? There isn't. Then why does the Bible go into detail about all the qualifications for having a bishop? Why does the Bible talk about here in Ephesians chapter 4 that God has given us specifically evangelists and teachers and prophets? <coughs> there's a point for it. Because as a babe, especially newborn babes in Christ, you don't know a lot. I know I didn't know a lot when I first got saved. I had been brought up in a, in a Christian home, quote unquote. It was a Presbyterian church that I was a part of. I learned a lot of basics. I knew a lot of simple facts of the Bible, of, you know, Jesus and the disciples and, you know, the basic story of Scripture. But I didn't really know very much. Those basic facts, they're pretty easy to come by. But when we're talking about doctrinal truths and just really understanding what the scripture is saying, you know, for up until the moment I was saved, I had blinders over my eyes. Couldn't understand the scripture, couldn't understand a lick of it. But after that salvation, the scales fell off and then you start to understand. But see, you're still a newborn babe. I was a newborn babe. I had a lot to learn, a lot to grow thereby. And that is one reason why church is so important because... As verse 14 says, 
We don't want to be children that are tossed about to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine because there's a lot of doctrines out there. There's a lot of people teaching all kinds of different things. And people who are literally using cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Now, a lot of people have a hard time with that because you think of like, I don't just try to trick people. And normally you probably wouldn't. That's not the way I was. But you know what? There are people out there that exist that are trying out there to deceive people. And the Bible is not lying to you when it says, hey, there's people that want to deceive you and want to trick you and they use doctrine to do it. We have to recognize it. It's a fact. When I was a babe, when I was brand new saved, I viewed it like, oh, cool. When I finally understood because salvation is so easy. I just put my faith in Christ. I was like, wow. And I had this, I had this understanding it was incorrect, but I just kind of thought at that moment that, oh, well, there's all these other, and I didn't know much about all the different religions, but I just kind of thought that they all were trusting in Christ. And stupid me, I, it took me this long to finally just realize, oh, I just have to put my faith in Christ. But I'm looking at the, you know, the Pentecostals or Catholics or what, I mean, just every gamut of the denomination. I'm just thinking that they're all saved. Right. I didn't really know any better. And because, I did, and because it was so simple, because I'm just saying it's so easy to get saved, <coughs> there's got to be just tons of people all over the place that are saved. A simplistic view, simple thought. Well, that's why you need to get teaching that demonstrates, no, there's doctrine that's really important and that a lot of these people, the vast majority of these people that are claiming the name of Christ they're not believing what you just believed to get saved. They're believing something totally different. They're adding works to salvation. They're thinking that their good deeds are going to help them along the way. They're thinking that what Jesus did on the cross is not enough to pay for, the, for your soul because they think you could just lose it if you sin. So their trust isn't really in Christ. I didn't understand these things. I needed help along the way. And if, you, if you're trying to do everything on your own, is the Holy Spirit going to guide you and lead you in all wisdom and truth? It can't. Yes. Yeah, the Bible says that. Could I sit and read from the Bible and learn? Yeah, but you know what's going to take a lot longer for me to grow without having a teacher to, to help show me along the way and help put some things together for me that they've already learned, that other people have taught them. That, uh, that is very plain in the text, but sometimes it just needs to be pointed out to you and say, oh, well, that's cool. I didn't see that before. Church is important. Now, I'm just laying the groundwork here because we need to understand the importance of church and what the Bible's talking about here with unity and having unity within the church. Because what I'm going to be covering this morning is one method that Satan uses to split churches and when he sees a church doing good works, serving the Lord, he's going to want to try to stop that. We went over this already. I went over a whole sermon about Satan's attack, resist the devil. And we need to be aware of this because this is a very common tactic that Satan's going to want to go in. And one of the ways he tries to, to destroy a church is by splitting it into pieces or into factions. And one of the ways he does it is by sowing discord among the brethren. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 6. Proverbs 6. Sowing discord. What does that mean? So when someone's sowing, this is a reference to sowing seed, right? So you're, if you're, if you're going to plant something, some crops or whatever, you go out and you sow seeds. When we plant grass, we get that big uh, spinner thing, the distributor, and, it, and it put the seeds inside there and the seed is just being spread all over the place, right? So that's just, we're just sowing seed. That's all that means. So when a brother, when, a, when someone comes in, they're sowing discord. Discord is going to be, you know, strife, disagreements, pitting people against each other. He's spreading that around within the church, trying to get the people to just be at odds with each other because then the body... When you've got a left hand over here and a right hand over here, instead of working together and picking things up and doing work, and I'm going to hold this, or I'm going to hammer with this hand, it's going. Yeah. 
You're not getting anything done. Body's not doing what it's supposed to be doing because it's fighting with itself. Look at Proverbs 6, verse number 12. We're going to see, because this is extremely wicked. It's an extremely wicked person that's going to go in and try to destroy a church by sowing discord. And you need to be aware of this and watch out for the people who are going to go about and try to do, try to sow discord in, in whatever way they try to do it. Usually it's by gossiping, slandering, trying to spread rumors, and just trying to say something to, to get people or even just, just bringing to light someone's sin. And I'm not talking about some grievous sin that needs to be dealt with as a church. I'm just talking about some sins that, hey, everyone's got a sin. You don't need to be just broadcasting and, pub and you know, publicizing everybody's sin to, to, to tear that person down. Proverbs 6, look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually, he soweth discord. Again, this is referencing a person that devises mischief continually. Someone who's a wicked person, a bad person. Not someone who's just confused. Not someone who's misunderstood. We're talking about a bad person that comes in and sows discord. Verse 15, Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and look at this, and he that soweth discord among brethren. It's an abomination in the sight of God that there would be someone to come in and sow discord to try to destroy the unity that a church is having. Or even just that brethren have between each other, the fellowship, the, the, the unity that's there. Someone that comes in to sow discord. The Bible says in Romans 16, you could turn there if you'd like, Romans chapter 16. It's that great passage at the, the last chapter in the book of Romans where he's going through and talking about saluting all the people that, that he's worked with and, and, you know, say hi to this person and, and this person helped me much and be sure to greet these people. And, you know, he's running down the list of all the people. But when he's getting through with that list in verse number 17, because he's already marked all these people that have been good people that have helped them out along the way. Now he comes along and says in verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions. Mark those people that are going around and sowing this discord and getting people pitted against each other and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Mark the people that cause division and have nothing to do with them. Avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. These people only care about themselves, is what verse 18 says. They serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. They don't care about Christ. They don't care about the cause of Christ. They don't care about the brethren. They care about themselves. They use good words. They use fair speeches to deceive the hearts of the simple. Now, not everybody that gets deceived is a bad person. But they're simple. As I went over last week, simple means stupid. It just, you know, they're ignorant. Maybe they're babes, okay? They're very simple. They don't understand much at all. We don't want to be simple. We want to be simple concerning evil, but wise concerning good. Now, um, I, the reason why I'm going into all of this, I normally stay out of stuff that's not our business. I don't like getting involved in other matters with other churches. We're an independent church. Yeah, right. We're run here. What really matters is what we're doing here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But when issues in other areas spill over into our church and start having an impact here specifically because of specific people or whatever 
that are, that are starting to bring an issue here, then I need to deal with it here. So the issue that I'm referring to is what happened with the Steadfast Baptist Church in Jacksonville. What ended up happening is that there is the, you know, Adam Fannin ended up pitting the people against each other there. And he was pitting himself against the, the leadership that was coming in and causing discord that a church basically split in half. A church that was doing good works for the Lord, that was going out and soul winning. And there are many people there that love God and want to serve God. And the church ended up being split. Now, I haven't said anything about this publicly just because, hey, it happened. It's their business. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because there are people that have gone along with what I'm going to which, which will I believe is rebellion. And it's very clear to see what happened. And I have a little bit of, of you know, direct dealing too, because I spoke with Adam Fannin personally for a couple of hours on the phone the day, the day that he had his conversation and the whole blow up and they kind of split apart. So um, I'm not just some total outsider not having any you know, intimate inf information on what's happening here. I've, I think I have enough information to judge appropriately on what happened over there. And I could tell from the conversations that I had with him that his intent, while he gave lip service to wanting to be someone, oh, I'll do whatever I have to do. If I have to step aside, it's not about me. It's about you. Know. Yeah, those are the right things to say. But that's not where his heart really was. And that was evident to me on the phone with him that he really wasn't willing to do those things because every time I said, well, you know what? Maybe the right thing to do is going to be, you know, are you really willing to do that? And it's always just something else. Well, no, I want, you know. Well, the people here, they want to ordain me. Well, you yourself said that you're not ready. You yourself said that you shouldn't be ordained. So why even bring that up as an option? I'm not going to go through all the details of that. It doesn't matter. What I want to point out, though, is first of all, if you don't know the situation very well, that church in Jacksonville was not independent. We are an independent Baptist church. We have nobody, no other affiliation or tie in any way to any other church. There is no authority structure where we have an outside authority governing our church other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That is the authority for this church. And then, uh, and that's it. So if some other church doesn't like what we do, it doesn't matter. They could not like it. There's a lot of people that don't like what we do or don't like what we believe. And they do their own things and, that, and whatever, right? We're going to do what we're doing here. And, uh, but that church, just so you understand, that was not an independent church. Now, it was a separate church because there was a local congregation in Florida versus a congregation in Fort Worth. But the authority, it was not independent by authority. It was not independent financially. It was reliant on the church that was planting that, that was starting that church. Very important concept to understand. Now, you may disagree with the method in which a church was planted, but that doesn't change the authority of structure in which that church was planted. So whether or not you, you like the way that some churches are started without pastors and then they get a pastor and then they become independent, doesn't matter. I mean, you could have your own belief on that, but the way that this church was started, not this church, but that church, the church in Florida was started was under the authority of another church, of another pastor that gave them all the direction and was overseeing what they did there. So the person who was running things who was ordained to be an evangelist. An evangelist in the Bible is someone who wins souls. Someone who goes out and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's their job. Because he had the ability to also teach people, he was doing that job. And the intention was that one day he would be able to pastor that church, but he wasn't ordained to pastor that church. And see, one of the ways that he was trying to be manipulative and beguile people was he kept on saying, well, I was ordained to start this church. 
You are ordained as an evangelist to win people to Christ, bring people together, but you are not, if you are already ordained to pastor that church, then why aren't you the pastor? Because you hadn't been ordained to pastor that church. You are submitting yourself to the authority of the sending church. So by breaking off, by talking amongst all the people and saying, we don't want to have this guy over us. We don't want to have this church ruling over us anymore. Let's split off. You're, you're in rebellion. Now, it would be one thing if you said, wow, our sending church has totally lost its way. They're teaching work salvation. They're teaching some damnable heresy. Then I can see splitting off and saying, we don't want to have any part with that. But that's not what happened. That's not what happened at all. There were some minor doctrinal differences that came about. And we're talking, look, this is not some big, this is not some reason to rip a body in two at all. And if the person that was leading was genuine and sincere in their service to Christ, they would recognize that there's a body here that I'm going to try to help stay together and not try to sow this discord and split us apart. Because when you split the body apart, it causes even more damage, even further destruction and, and disruption to the cause of Christ. And now they're, they're starting over. There's going to be a lot of people that, that are impacted by this that didn't have to be. Turn, if you would, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 15. What happened there was direct rebellion over the leadership that was coming into play that had already been established from the, the inception of that church. The authority was there. When the leadership changed from the sending church that had the authority, they didn't like it. When I say they, it was the guy that was interested in himself. The guy that wanted so bad to be in charge and be ordained, but he wanted it his way. And just to give you a little insight, we had someone just visit from, their, from the church that didn't side with Adam Fan and that didn't side with the rebellion. And I was curious because I asked him, when I, when I had spoken with Adam Fan on that Friday, I had brought up the possibility and I didn't say I would do it, just, just, in all, you know, just to give you the full understanding of what, what was spoken. I said I would prayerfully consider getting involved because just through, you know, through my conversation, I can see that things weren't going to work. I could see that he had no respect for the leadership coming in. I can see that there is no way he was going to work with this man for his own personal reasons because he just had no regard and no respect for him at all. So he didn't want to have anything to do with him. And in the spirit of trying to keep things running, I was willing to offer and say, well, you know what, let me see, if, you know, because maybe we're a little bit more aligned doctrinally. If you're concerned about these other things, let's just see. You're close in proximity to us, relatively speaking. I'll see what I can do. Maybe if it's going to work with my family, if it's going to work with my work schedule, if it's going to work with our church so that I'm not taking away from our church, what if I help get involved, right? It's an, it's, it's an option, trying to make, give an option here, trying to make things work so that we don't have this split, so we don't have these people just being torn apart, trying to keep things going together. But one of the things that I mentioned was that, because he was complaining already about how, well, Pastor Shelley isn't going to you know, he doesn't think I'll be ready. You know, he doesn't want to ordain me for another two years or something. And I said, but here's the thing with me. I said, look, maybe we're more aligned doctrinally, but I'm probably going to be even stronger against just ordaining someone early on because my views on that are a little bit different than other people. And if I'm going to be the one responsible for laying hands on someone and ordaining them to be a pastor, 
I need to be convinced that they're ready to lead. And I personally don't think that someone who has an 18 month old child and a newborn baby has been proven to have the qualifications to one rule their own house well in order to run the church. I think they need I think children need to be grown up more than that. I think in or because the whole point is to see are they ruling their house well? And the evidence is going to come in the fruit of their loins and in their own children. Can they handle and manage their children well? I want to see that evidence before I'm going to ordain anyone. And look, this is, goes for everybody here. If you're interested in becoming a pastor or a preacher, I'm going to want to look at your family and not a toddler. He didn't like that. In fact, he never even mentioned to the church that I had even considered that, that offer of, well, hey, if the problem is with the doctrine, well, I'm a little bit more lined up on these couple of issues that you brought up. It wouldn't be as big of a deal then maybe if, you know, if that's the real issue. But you know what? That wasn't the real issue. That wasn't the issue. The issue was himself. The issue was his own wickedness, wanting to be in charge and wanting to be ordained. You know what he told me? He said, well, I'm not ready now, but I'll be ready in six months or I'll be ready in four months. Whatever. I forget exactly the time frame he said. How can you know that you will just be ready? Well, I'll just be ready here unless maybe you just put some generic time frame of just, well, my child needs to be this old and that's what I think from, from scripture. So then I'll be ready. That just shows me you're not ready. When you think, well, I'll just be ready on this day. Well, why aren't you ready now then? If you can know how long it's going to take you to be ready, then why aren't you just ready right now? The reason why I'm spending so much time in going into this is that there are people that have sided with that wicked person who's in rebellion, who's sowing discord, who's doing damage to the church. And I'm not saying that all those people are bad people, but they've been deceived. And we need to know how to deal with that. The question has already been brought up to me. And if the question has been brought up, I feel that it's my job to teach on this subject, to make sure we're all in unity here and understand biblically and scripturally why we take stands that we take. Why should we do this? Why should we do that? I don't think that we should be fellowshipping with the people who are caught up in rebellion against a good church, against good leadership, against other good people where they have just broken apart for no good reason and followed after some wicked person that only cares about himself. And the reason why I don't think we should fellowship, one, is because we don't want to edify that behavior and support that. But two, if you really care about the people who have been deceived, assuming they're deceived and they're not evil themselves, that's the way I'm going to look at people. I'm not going to assume that they're all just bad people. I'm just going to take the, the, the approach, give people the benefit of the doubt and say, well, they've been caught up in the fair speeches. They've been caught up in their, and been a little bit mixed up in the arguments that, that he's trying to make. Trying to say, oh, well, who is this guy? We don't know him. How can we have this guy? You know, we're just asking for more time. No, you're just asking to be ordained, but you're telling the people, oh, we just want a little bit more time. And anyone who knows the people involved knows. And this is, this is the one thing that stood out to me because I know the men involved very well. I know Pastor Anderson very well. I don't know Brother Shelley really well, but I know him enough to know that neither of those people are just just dealing with things, flying off the rails, making just, just uh, decisions without giving a lot of thought to them flippantly. They don't do that. They don't just let their emotions rule them. Okay, I know them really well. And based on the whole situation, it was clear what was going on. But the people who have been deceived, we care about them. But that's why you need to be able to show a tough love of saying, no, you really need to understand that this is wicked, that he is a wicked guy and you should be removing yourself from him. And 
the way that I'm going to show that to you is say, you know what, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Get right on this because that's rebellion. And rebellion is a really wicked sin. Look at 1 Samuel 15, verse number 22. The Bible says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. This is when King Saul is being rebuked. Why is he being rebuked? He's being rebuked by Samuel because Samuel wasn't there. Now, Samuel was a priest. He was the one that was supposed to be making the sacrifices and giving the offerings unto the Lord before the battle. King Saul was like, well, hey, he's not here, so I'm going to step in and I'm going to fill this role because this just needs to be done. Well, he totally disregarded the word of the Lord when God said, no, this is the job of the priest. This isn't the job of the king. This isn't the job of someone who's of the tribe of Benjamin. That was Samuel's job. And you can't just step in and do it when God was very specific on what was supposed to be done and who was supposed to do it. That's why he's saying, do you think God really cares that much about the sacrifices that he wants you disregarding his word just to make the sacrifice? That's not what it's about, son. He wants you listening and obeying. That's what he wants. And if the sacrifice wasn't made, then the sacrifice is not made. But you obeying is way more important than that sacrifice being made. Than, than that goat or that ram and that blood, you know, of that animal being sacrificed right there is not as important as your obedience. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You know what type of, of sentence witchcraft took in the Bible? Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. It's a death penalty. And this is saying that rebellion is, is like that. It's like a sin that is so grievous that they had the death penalty on it. Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. If we're going to take everything that Adam Fannin said in this whole situation to be the truth, well, at the very least, he's hearkening unto, be, let's say there are some wicked people in the church. He's still not fit to lead or rule if you're listening to what these other people say that are saying to do something wicked. They're saying to do something against what's right, going against the authority. Rebel against what, you're supposed to, what, what your authority is as a church. If you're going to listen to those people, you ought to just step aside anyways and definitely not go start up some new church somewhere. It's wickedness. Last place I'll be turned, look at Psalm 75. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 11, an evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. No. Psalm 75 is the last place we'll look at this morning. The root of the problem with Adam Fenn was that he wanted to be lifted up according to his way, in his time, and he was the one that wanted to basically appoint when his ordination would be. It doesn't work like that. You don't choose when you get ordained. The man of God Amen. that's going to put their hands on that person, the one who decides when that person's going to get ordained because they're the one responsible for making sure that they fit the bill. You don't just come along and say, well, I'll let you lead if you ordain me in four months. That ain't the way it works. And that's the exact attitude and that's the reason why Pastor Shelley said, you know what? If you guys stay steadfast by the church, Adam Fannin's out because you cannot work with someone 
who is that self-promoting and only cares about himself and is going to dictate the way things are going to be to their boss, to their authority structure. Anybody who's a boss, anyone who's even just in business or whatever, you know that you can't work with an employee that's going to try to usurp your own authority and tell you what to do. That's rebellion. It don't work. Those people get fired. They get let go. Because you need to be able to respect the authority of, of the boss, of the person in charge. And he wasn't willing to do that. Psalm 75 explains what's the right way. Look at verse number four. The Bible says, I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly, and to the wicked, lift not up the horn. Lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted." Horns in the Bible is referring to leadership or kings or people in charge, people in authority. And he's saying, don't lift up your own horn on high. Don't lift up yourself to be some great person. Don't uh, promote yourself and be self-promoting. It says promotion doesn't come from the east or from the west or from south. It comes from the north. It comes from above. It comes from the Lord in heaven. He's going to be the one to lift you up in due time. Sure. You humble yourself. You serve you serve the people. You serve your authority. You are a servant. Amen. If you want to be a leader at all and you wait and you wait as long as you need to wait until the time is right, until God sees fit to then put you in the position. And anybody seeking their own promotion is not fit for the job at all because pastoring a church is not about getting the glory and getting the attention and oh, everybody look at me and listen to me. It's about being a servant. Amen. It's about being a minister. Helping other people. If you don't have the humble attitude, you're going to fail at being a godly leader. You may succeed at being a, a megachurch pastor when you only care about yourself and you want to fleece the people for money. Yeah, you could succeed if all you care about is that and you don't care about people. Sure. You could make great orations and mess with people's emotions and lie to people and get them to give you money. And if you call that success, sure, go ahead and do that. But if you want to be a man of God, it starts with humility and ministering and steaming others better than yourselves and having that spirit and heart with you that the way that Christ was willing to give of himself for other people. And if he says, if I have to die for everyone else to live, then that's what I'm going to do. And Adam Fannin should have said, if I have to step aside and be done with this, in order for this church to continue and strive and be in one accord and have this unity of spirit, then that's what I'm going to do. He said it, but wasn't willing to do it because it wasn't in his heart because he is double talker. Amen. And we're going to have nothing to do with a wicked person like that. And the people who are following that wicked man, they need to get right with God. And I hope they do. Yeah, that's right. Right. And until they do, I don't want a fellowship with them. Amen. It's about right as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that we could receive from your word. God, I pray that you would please just help us all to um, be able to have discernment, to, to know right from wrong, to make good choices in our life, to be able to... Uh, live out and act out what your words say. Lord, um, help us to not only understand your instruction, but to do them, that we wouldn't get uh, carried away or be fearful as Saul was of the people or, or try to just be a people pleaser. Help us to be God pleasers. Lord, we want to do what's right. And Lord, we, we pray for the people who are deceived. We pray for the lost people who are deceived by false religions. I pray that you please help us to give them the truth of the gospel. And I pray for believers, Lord, who put their faith in Jesus Christ and have been deceived by wicked people. Lord, help us to be able to just get the truth out there and um, in the best way we know how to be able to um, 
to expose the, the wickedness of the, the false leader. And um, God, I pray that you please just use our church to do great things this afternoon. Help us to get many people saved. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.